Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today we have a very special guest, the Honorable Michael G. Williamson, Chief United States Bankruptcy Judge, who will deliver his uh, State of the District Address. If you'll recall, um, then Chief Judge Gentleman began the practice of delivering uh, State of the District Addresses throughout the various divisions of the district. Um, and uh, she served as Chief Judge from October 2011 until uh, th uh, this past October, or rather September 30th. Um, on October 1st of last year, uh, Chief Judge Williamson began his service as Chief Judge of the District, and I'm excited to uh, excited that Chief Judge Williamson has decided to continue the practice of visiting the divisions and delivering a State of the District address. Um, brief bio, I promised uh, Judge Williamson that I'd keep it uh, brief, but uh, Chief Judge Williamson commenced his service as a United States bankruptcy judge in 2000 and was reappointed to a new 14-year term uh, in 2014. Um, Chief Judge Williamson has at least two special connections um, to our division. Many of you will recall that in 2007, I think it was the spring, uh, Chief Judge Williamson sat here in Fort Myers for four or six months uh, while uh, Judge Pasquet recovered from a sudden illness. Um, the connection that uh, less of us may recall is that when Chief Judge Williamson was appointed in 2000, uh, he took the seat of Judge Pasquet. Um, of course, Judge Pasquet went on to serve for another 11 plus years. Uh, prior to commencing his federal service, Chief Judge Williamson was in private practice in Orlando with the McGuire Voorhees and Wells firm, which later merged with Holland and Knight. So please join me in welcoming Chief Judge Williamson. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I do uh, feel a special affinity for this group. Is um, I, I knew I came to know you all very well in the time I spent here, and then I kept up with you over the years since. And it really is a special group that you have down here. That, uh, it's one of the, the finest bars anywhere, and it's small, and you want to keep it that way, keep all the outsiders out. <laughs> it, Miami is not outsiders, Mr. Ogadelli, we're, we're, we're including you here. So, but thank you for coming. Um, I, I appreciate this opportunity. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach. I could talk to you about some statistics, but yeah, that's depressing. Who wants to hear about filings are down? You know that. Um, I could bring you up to speed on our pilot uh, judge program, which I will do because it won't take much time at all. But what I'm going to talk about here uh, this afternoon is something that uh, I always wondered about. Before I became a judge, I was wondered about two things. Uh, now I've solved one of them. What, the first was, what is it? What happens behind the judge's door? You know, what do, what do judges do? I was never. I really. The one thing I missed in my education as I was never a law clerk, I wasn't an intern, I never saw the other side. And so, but now I know what goes on behind the door because I've been doing it for 15 years. But the other thing I didn't know is what goes on in the clerk's office and how do they actually do what they do? What do they do? And you know what, when I became a judge, it became even a bigger mystery because we're not, we don't really work with them down at the line level. We, all we do is we, I come to my chambers and there's a calendar and if it, it was something important, my law clerk would have told me the day before, maybe I would have prepared, but I usually prepare that morning, I'll go in, I issue my rulings, and that's the beginning and end of my job. As I tell new judges, your job as a judge is to make a ruling and sign the dang order when it comes in, that's it. You don't have to get it right, you don't have to be pissy, you don't have to be cool on the bench, you just got a rule and then sign the darn order. Well, that means I don't know a lot more about what goes on. So I decided I would learn, and as long as I was learning, I would just tell you what I learned. So with that, let me update you on our pilot judge. You're all probably familiar with this. South Dakota is the least busy division, well, the second least. They're 89 out of 90, and they have two statutory judgeships, only one of which has ever been filled. And that one judge has 150 cases on a case-weighted basis, 150. We are at number two out of 90, 
and we had like 1780 on a case weighted basis. So somebody had the bright idea, and I don't know, this was just so brilliant, I can't believe it came out of our government today, but that's another, another topic. They said, well, why don't we take that empty spot and share it with uh, the Middle District of Florida? And somehow they worked it out, a memorandum of understanding was worked out between the 11th and the 8th Circuit so that we're borrowing a South Dakota, a Dakota judge with the understanding if those 150 case-weighted cases ever get to 1,500, we got to send her back. Or send her there, because she's never been there. Um, I can't say who it is, but I think all of you know. Uh, and that's going very well, by the way. Hopefully the FBI thing is done, and hopefully any day we're going to get an order appointing the new judge. She will physically um, be stationed in Orlando, and that's just simply where we had a place to put her, but that will, she'll be in Orlando, judge, she'll be in that draw, she'll have her chambers there. But we'll also give her um, some chapter 13s um, that in uh, Tampa, so that she'll have uh, things going on in Tampa. And uh, Judge Funk and Judge Glenn have both indicated that they'll give her adversary proceedings in Jacksonville. So if you have any adversary proceedings up there, you may be in front of the new, the new judge. Um, now let me let me turn to my my topic. In uh, when CMECF first went into into effect, and thank goodness for CMECF. I don't think any of us can remember, but we can remember. But it was a different world when the mailings were just just huge, and you know, getting stuff out, and getting service of, of notices of hearing. Um, we had at that time um, about. Well, it, it was a lot more than this 15,000 here. What happened in 2005, you know, BEPSIPA was enacted and the cases fell down. But the point here is that we had 137 employees, down from about 180 at the highest point, down to 137, handling the 15,000 cases that we had back then. Our cases have been down, but our case management staff has gone down, down, down. And, and um, you know, we have, I, I was in Jacksonville, in uh, doing this about three weeks ago, and I looked across this huge expanse of empty office area, and almost like a, a little village in a prairie in an old western movie where, the, where, where the, the cubicles were now. There was just this tiny little group of case managers that used to do what it took a room full of people to do. And, and I'm going to explain to you how they, how they do that. Um, how does how do 83.5 employees, and by the way, the .5 is Paula Luce, sorry Paula, but we share Paula with the district court, so that's, that's even better because she, holds, she wears two hats rather proudly for them. We couldn't do, do it without her down here, no, Judge Shalina just loves to work with her. Um, let me put things in perspective, that's 30,000 people, okay, and, when, and that, that sort of gives you a feel, 30,000 people and we're going to say how many chapter uh, sevens would be, that be about 66% 60, is what our average is. And how many chapter 13s? 31%. And I have one of the interns do a little you know, re, uh, research for me. In chapter seven case in which nothing happens, which is a good case, you charge your 1500, nothing happens, you get the discharge, there's no objection to anything, just sails through beautifully. That, that's 15 docket entries for one of those cases. And we know that's not, that's the rare case. Chapter 13, in which, quote, nothing happens, it sails through, everything's approved, no objections, 35. So you do the math, and you have this group of people doing 622,000 docket entries to get those cases through, even if they were cases which nothing ever happened. It's really probably a million eight or two million docket entries by this, this group of people. Actually, of that group of pe people, only 38 are case managers, and we're going to get into how they process those cases. You know, so how do they do it? Well, one way is because of their level of experience, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But the second has to do with what Judge Gentleman accomplished during her four years as Chief Judge. Um, when, when I started as a judge, um, I, I arrived in Tampa 
And there was Judge Pasquet, and Judge Baines, and Judge Glenn, and Judge Corcoran, and me. And I arrived, and, and I asked my supervisor, my own, my very own supervisor, and I said, she, she said, well, Judge, how do you want to do this? And I said, well, I don't know. How do we do it? She, and I said, well, just do it how the way Judge Pasquet does it. And over time, I would say, why did we do this? She says, I don't know. I said, go talk to Chuck. Find out why we do this. And Chuck says, that's just because that's the way we've always done it. I said, wait a minute. We, don't have, we, we won't do it that way anymore. So I developed the way I did things. And that became the Williamson team way. So we have the Williamson team, the Pasquet team, the Baines team, Corcoran team, and the Glenn team. Five teams. Fifty case managers for five judges. It's a huge number. In our whole district now, we have 38. Back then, 10 apiece handling, the, doing it the Williamson way. And one of the things I noticed right on is, you know, we all use different forms. And I asked Chuck, how, how many forms do we have? He said, Judge, we've got about 3,000. I said, w why? This is because uh, Judge Baines doesn't want Times Roman font. And so he, he wants elite, you know, superior, whatever. And Judge Pasquet wants to say, order to judge and decree. Order to judge and decree. What about if we put numbers? No, no, no numbers, just order to judge and decree. So to find, you know, the, the 14th order to judge and decree on the seventh page, you'd have to go through the process. So I finally got started collecting those forms. I figured out all these differences, which really were at the level of font or, or stylistic. And I, I got, made a little bit of progress. But the fact was that we were eight little kingdoms, each with our own establishment and the way we each did, did things. And Judge Gentleman realized that in order to deal with the budget cuts and the reduced staff and the, our, our, the need that we continue processing that huge number of people that I showed you, we had to get on the same page. And the concept of our current motto, one district, one court, embodies what she sought, set out to accomplish and what she did accomplish, as I'm going to show you here. Although we're not quite there, and we'll talk about that. There's a few little things that we have to do. The other way we do it, the clerks do it, is, and, and, and I mean them, not me, is their years of experience. Now, you can see here the lowest number of years is five, and the highest is 36. Now, I'm, I have, I think, 16 years, so I would, I'd be here. I'd be pretty low in seniority in this group. If you're looking, I'm the, I'm the senior judge in, in terms of years in office in the Tampa division. So all, all of our Tampa judges would be between me and somewhere over here. So you can see the real experience that we have. That's a total of 1,492 years of experience. And these people are good. I mean, I sat down with them. And to learn all this, by the way, I, ha I said, you train me on what you do. Pretend I'm a new case manager. And they actually set up a curriculum for me, and I sat down with them. And they're incredibly um, dedicated. They're smart. They know this stuff. They've been doing it forever. They've been through regime after regime. They never leave until they retire, or we, could, we may have to do a buyout. Um, we, they wear a couple of... Uh, uh, years where we, we did have to lay, let off a, a small number of people, but generally they're here forever as long as, you know, um, there's a place for them which they will be forever because we've managed, Lee and Bennett has managed our, our staffing so that we don't have to let people go. Now, here's our current organizational oops, chart. You can see at the top is it's one organizational chart rather than uh, four, uh, three organizational charts. And, and when you see uh, Tampa, Tampa and Fort Myers, it, as always has been the case, is consolidated for clerk's office purposes. The, the Pasquet team resided in, in Tampa, and now Judge Delano, her team resides uh, along with our team. In fact, her team is part of my team. Um, we have director operations, but where the work gets done on your cases of course, we have these deputies in charge. Now we have two. Kathy Dietz now does Orlando 
and uh, Tampa and Fort Myers, uh, and Gold Weaver does Jacksonville. Um, so they're, they, they're the sort of the management. We have supervisors. Um, we've got four of those. But where the case management gets done are, are the generalist, the generalist open cases. And there's three of those in Tampa. Here's the generalist. And two in Orlando. There's none in Jacksonville. That's because we open all, this is part of the uniformity, which is amazing as is happening, that we, we, we open our case, the, uh, all the cases in the district, um, ex except for sevens, uh, no, except for elevens and thirteens, they're opened in Jacksonville because of a, a just a work distribution. Um, we have the supervisors I mentioned, and then case managers, we have 18 in Tampa, now that's for four judges. So a little bit about four and a half per judge, where we used to have ten. And then ten in Orlando and ten in Jacksonville. And Jacksonville has two, and Orlando until recently had two plus a recall judge. And then the intake clerks, they're the very nice people who deal with the public, but they also actually are the first step in every case opening. They do the assignment of judges and trustees and and the 341 meeting date, that gets done at, at, at that level. Um, now, in order to get us all on one page, what Judge Gentleman realized, you couldn't get, it would not work to get um, all eight of our judges in a room and say, okay, we've got eight ways of doing these this hundred things, you all work it out. It just wouldn't work. I mean, it would have, um, I, well, I could say it would have taken years, it, it would not have worked, because if you ask me the way we should do it, well, obviously the way I do it is the best, because that's the way I do it. I wouldn't do it that way if it weren't the best way, and same with Judge McEwen, and, and on, on you go. And So she realized, after she went on this tour and met with over 300 people, she met with the clerk's office, she met with the public, she met with the bar leaders and all that, and she came to the realization that in order to get us all on one page, it was going to have to be come from the bottom up. In other words, it wasn't going to be the judges all getting together in one room, the top down. It was going to be getting the clerks all together and with input from the bar and the, the trustees and so forth. And, um, and, and then they would come up with what is the best way to do things because they're the ones doing it. You know, frankly, as we'll come out in this a little bit, it turned out that none of us really knew how we did it anyway, other than my way is the best. And we're all, we all shared that view, I can tell you. It's the only thing we had uniform, uniformity on. <laughs> and so she developed these committees. And as you'll see, I'll go through them. So implementing committees is my term. It's one in, in international development work and legal systems. The implementing committees, or the implementing uh, institutions are the ones you have to have to make something like you have to have courts are called implementing institutions or clerk's offices. Bar associations and things of that nature are supporting and they're just as important but you'll never get to the website committee unless you have the actual procedures over here. So these are the really really important committees. As time goes on the supporting committees become the important committees because their work is gets done. But to kick it off she started with the procedures gathering committee. Now this is this was the first step she, um, she had identified that our procedures were scattered across eight teams of case managers. And um, so she put together, these are all case managers, except for Laura Stevenson, who's the JA for Judge Delano. And, but the, the rest of them are all case managers with an enormous amount of years of experience. And they collected all the procedures, and they sat and they sifted through them. Um, they, they, they could see immediately the, the problems. Written procedures didn't exist in, in each of the division. Uh, most of them weren't up to date. Um, some were spelled out in old emails or collections. You know, it reminded me, um, years ago, Judge Pasquet asked me to chair the original rules committee, and so I embarked on the task of doing 
a set of local rules. We never had, we didn't have them in 1984. And, and what I did is I collected all the procedures from all of my colleagues around the Middle District, put them in a pile, and started working on coming up some, with something. And that's basically what they did. They came up with what were the procedures, and they sort of came up with some preliminary ideas as to the way they thought it ought to, ought to work. And they sent their results to the procedures drafting committees. And this is a slightly higher level. Uh, and you can see it's a smaller number. Um, Michael Schumpert is the, uh, the head you know, clerk, or the or below Gall Weaver, is the supervisor in Jacksonville. Uh, Mary Maddox, who is the grammarian and, and scrivener, Tina Mason, uh, Sarah Mason, uh, and Christine, who was one of the CMECF administrators. And they sat down with the input from the drafting committees, and they came up um, with one draft procedure for each thing. Um, the, um, the, the use of automation became a big part of it, um, and they were able to come up with a procedure. And, what, what, and then, then the task went to Judge um, uh, Gentleman to sell us on these procedures. So as these procedures were working their way up, well, let me mention a couple more committees and then I'll get to that. We also had, this was another important committee, uh, was the IT testing committee. Now they weren't out there looking for software, they were testing the software that was being developed to implement all these procedures. And a, a very important committee. Um, and a steering committee. Uh, this is made up of representatives of all of the bar associations. You all three, you'll see three of your colleagues are, are on the steering committee. Um, we have three, uh, two people from the clerk's office, Mary Maddox, who's um, the committee administrator. But, but uh, the U.S. Trustees Office is represented, the Chapter 7 Trustees, Chapter 13. They're sort of the interface with the public on these procedures that were coming up. Um, there's a total of 23 people on that committee, and uh, you have three from your bar, bar association down here. Um, they also put together the bench bar uh, conference in each year. And, and so far, some of the things they've worked on, and you've seen some of these changes, um, the state procedures, reaffirmation procedures, the 2004 examinations, we, we now have a, a new procedure on that. Adversary proceedings, you've seen a huge change in, in that. Uh, chapter 13 procedures, it's gone through substantial rewrite, the order establishing duties, the model plan, and the confirmation order. And it, those things just didn't happen. They happened because they were bubbled up from the bottom, steering committee vetted, and ultimately the judges signed, signed off on that. Now the upcoming assignments for that committee uh, include review and, uh, of suggested revisions to the local rules. Judge Delano is the judge in charge of our local rules. That's a fabulous and tireless job, bringing, putting all that together. And the, their project this year is to work on some of the discovery changes. Um, suggested revisions to the new Chapter 11 uh, debtor in possession operating order. You notice we start started using an order that automatically gets entered in every chapter 11. Well, that was a steering committee. They came, they said, hey, we used to do this and it's really handy if you're rep representing a debtor in possession. You open up a, a dip account. Some banks want to see an order that authorizes that. So we, we said, okay. And so that's why you see that order now. And, and they're going to work on some revisions. Um, a website committee um, tell you about that a little bit. Um, they are again drawn from the, the uh, entire district. Our web administrator, Marco Aguayo, is over in Orlando. That uh, website, usually you think that's sort of oh, no big deal, um, but it, it is so useful and so functional that in 2014 this website uh, was awarded uh, as one of the 10 best websites, court websites in the country uh, by the Forum on Advancement of Court Technologies. We're the only federal judge, uh, federal uh, district to be on that, that list. It was, so it's a real, uh, we have some really, really good people in our IT department. And you'll see some of the stuff they developed here in a minute. Um, our training committee, um, all of this took a lot of training. Our training committee, uh, 
They're responsible for creating, implementing, and monitoring the staff training plan. Um, they do a, a district-wide strategic plan every year, what training is going to go on. And they also are planning our fourth uh, all-person off-site. Last year, I, I, it's the first one I participated in, uh, some of the judges couldn't make it because of a conflict with the, the federal judicial um, training session. I did go, and it was just fabulous. You know, we all started off a little, you know, with it was the judges, there were three of us there, but all the clerk's office personnel got together, and over two days of this, these training type of programs, everybody really bonded, got to know each other across the, the districts. It was really a wonderful thing, and we're going to repeat it this year. The uh, outreach committee was set up to improve relations among the different divisions. They didn't know each other when this all started. Now they really do. They talk and they converse, and you'll see why that's going to be important. The, the Court Connection Newsletter Committee now is one of our vehicles to bring things to your attention. You see articles there. Ed Comey, who's my law clerk, um, is the uh, editor of that. And then the source. This is internal. Um, it's in our intranet, and it's used by the case managers as they go through and manage your cases. I'm going to show you this in more detail in a moment. Um, they have immediate resource to our procedures manual. Now, that's an internal procedures manual that was developed through this four years of getting together and working through and drafting and getting the judges on board. Now, we don't share that with you because we frankly don't want to know, let you know things that you might, you know, could end run on. Oh, they're not checking for service on this, so we won't do service on this. We want to keep it guessing a little bit. But we are going to do this. We're, we've developed, and Judge Gentleman just finished, an external procedures manual, which is, going to, which is married up with the internal. So for each thing is in our internal, we're going to tell you what you need to do to do it right. And we're going to, you know, it'll have links to, to the code sections and things like that, forms and places like that, so you'll be able to go and see. You can, as I'll show you here in a moment, we already have training modules set up for you and your staff for many of the things that you do. And you think, because you've been doing it forever, that you don't need to go sharpen the tools and do that sort of stuff. Well, you know, really, you really do. I mean, I, I knew as a lawyer that when I had a, you know, a motion to file, I would go read the rule every time. And son of a gun, if I wouldn't have missed something, but for just looking the rule, look at the statute, so that you don't get caught because you get so... Or, or I, and one thing I would tell my people, you would not use a form. Because then, then the, I can spot a form Oh, I'd say, and I'll, I'll ask a lawyer, oh, this looks like I sticked a right out form before the, the Kmart decision. You know, they'll look at me like, you know, they thought it was a good form because it's a good form. So you've got to be careful on that. And we're going to have it for you, and we'll keep all this stuff up to date. Now, the next slide, it transitions into the actual programs. But I thought in order to set the stage, um, and given Judge Pasquet's um, journey, from 1963 to 2011, and what he witnessed and had to go through, that uh, this would be sort of a transition into talking about some of our programs. Do you do on Skype? Yeah, that I am. Yeah, so good. Okay. Yeah, hi, do. I got that. Hi, do. Yeah. Yeah, what gäller det? Um, yeah, that is here. Yeah, will you sit? Thank you. Yeah. Uh huh. Ja, så den, jeg har ikke fått gjort noen ting hele formiddag, ja. Okay, nei, jeg beklager at det tar tid, altså, skjønner vi holder på å legge om til et helt nytt system, og da skal alle ha hjelp på en gang, vet du. Ja, ja. Eh, så du kommer ikke inn i den, eller? Nei, den bare ligger der. Ok, har du forsøkt å åpne den? Ja, åpne den, altså, hvis det hadde vært så enkelt, så hadde jeg jo ikke tilkalt help til, skal det vel? Nei, det er jo sant. Nei, nei. Du har ikke på en fan? Nei, da, det skal være fort gjort, det er det, ja. vi se. Eh, du bare gjør... Der. Sånn. Ja. Da er du i gang. Ja, altså så langt kom jeg også. Ok. Men, men, men så stoppet det opp, og så var jeg redd for at noe av teksten skulle forsvinne, ah. så jeg turte ikke å gå videre. Å oh, ja, ok. Nei, men du skjønner at inni her, mm. så ligger det kanskje flere hundre sider med lagret tekst. Mm. Så for å kom, komme videre, så tar du tak i et, et ark mm. på den måten her, og så liksom, blar du over på neste side sånn. Da fortsetter teksten der. Jeg blar altså? Du blar, ja. Men, men når jeg skal tilbake da? Ja, da bare blar du tilbake igjen. Ta tak der. Og så, det er jo sånn. Der, så er du tilbake til den teksten du hadde sagt. Ikke noe... Ok, så slutter der. Ja. Ja. Og så, så 
fortsätta den där ja. Okej, okay, men men när när jag ska avsluta för dagen vad gör jag då? Ja, bara står du sammen permene. Ja, på den måten där. Så Det er lukket her, ligger alt lagret inni deg. Jeg risikerer ikke å miste noe av teksten her nå. Nei, alt ligger lagret inni her nå. Ja. I tilfellet setter fyr på hele greia, det er kanskje litt sannsynlig. Så. Ja, ok. Nei, men for det er noe med det at ikke sant, når du har holdt på med, med, med skriftruller, ja. så, så tar det litt grann tid å, 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 å konvertere til å bla i en, i en bøk. Ja. Mm. Ja. Ja, ja, 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 ja. Sånn, ja, og så, hva du kalte det? Blar. Jeg blar. Ja, blar i det. Blar, hjem og tilbake. Ja, og når, er, ligger der helt ligger, Ja, og når jeg, når jeg skal, er ferdig, så bare lukker jeg den. Nei. Flott. Fint det. Kjempefint. Ja, flott det. Ja, men du, nei, nei, men, ikke sant? Nei. Nå er den sånn igjen, nå får jeg ikke åpne den. Nå får jeg ikke åpne den. Ja, du har, det er fra feil side. Du åpner, åpner med å åpne fra, fra andre siden. Så det er ikke likegyldig det, altså? Nei, nei, åpne fra den siden der. Sånn. Der. Der er den Ja vel. Har du okay. lest manualen eller? Manualen? Jeg skal følge med som manualen, så brukerveiledning. Det er sikkert den der. Der vet du. Å oh, ja, I den ja. I den står alt sammen. Ja, ja men ikke sant, der har du samme problemet. Mm. Får den ikke opp. Få opp litt også. Ok, det skulle vi kanskje ha tenkt på. Uh, we had to start somewhere. And these are the programs I'm now going to walk you through. And these are the programs that drives this system, this one court, um, one, one uh, district. Um, CMECF, you know CMECF. Can you imagine living without CMECF and what it means to us and, and just can't go on in the amount of uh, ability that our clerk's office now has because of the ability to process things electronically and same with the lawyers out there. But we didn't have, our call we developed all internally, not meaning, not me, but the people in, internal, uh, Mike Brown and Bill McGinnis are two of the key people in that, brilliant programmers. They created that out of nothing. That's going to be probably one of the national models. ADI was, I uh, think, came out of uh, Utah. I'll get into that a little bit more. But basically, I, got, I call this one HAL. Remember HAL, the computer from 2001, A Space Odyssey? Well, that's what HAL does. HAL, ADI, makes decisions that used to be made by our case managers. And the sort of the rule of thumb is, if, you, if, if these four or five conditions exist, and a case manager 1,000 times in a row without no deviation does this, then we don't need a case manager to do that. It's just like when I went through the process of th thinking, what orders do I need to see and sign? I said, if I, have to, if I sign it 1,000 times without changing it, why am I signing it? I, don't, I can assign that. And so ADI will now do it for the clerk's office. And you'll see that it's a huge deal in terms of savings of person power. Um, CHAP is our Chambers Automation Program. It's what the interface that your, the courtroom deputy, courtroom deputy's interface into the case management system is through this CHAP system. So if we need a, a hearing, from the, that comes up from the case managers and it opens in CHAP. And, and I'll show you how that works. Uh, ballots used in Chapter 11 used to go in in hard copy. They'd be collected in a boot. Now we have this e-ballot uh, system. Exhibit upload, I think uh, those of you who tried cases recently know that we're now requiring that exhibits be filed electronically, and we'll talk about that a little bit. E-orders, you've noticed, we now do that e-order thing, which you see the tip of the iceberg when you see this, this signature on the top, which doesn't look very judicial. Judge Pasquet would never have agreed to that, <laughs> and I understand that. But, but it's a lot more than that. E-orders now, and I'll show this to you, allows you to track where your orders are. And then we can find it for you, and we say, okay, we'll get to that. Whereas before, you'd call for an order, and everybody looked like you, why are you calling? You know, it's somewhere in the system. Somewhere in the building is your order. No more. An e-request is an internal thing. So when one of our case managers has a great idea or a problem, it goes into e-request, and we, we track these, we monitor them, and we make sure they're responded to in a timely fashion, and it works. I got rave reviews from the case managers about that. Um, this is the aqua, how the aqua system works conceptually, and then I'll be more, more uh, specific. You file a case, it goes to intake. The in there's a person in each of the um, divisions where we take cases in, which is Tampa, Orlando, and Jacksonville. That person then opens the case in a ca cash register system. That's something we developed long ago. It's sort of out of date, but it works. It's not part of Aqua, but it's hooked into Aqua. And that's what brings the case into our Aqua system. 
um, that make they make the, that that program makes the trustee and judge assignments for new cases in a process of opinions. The generalist, I told you, we have five of those. The case then goes to the generals, who then open the electronically filed cases. They um, QC, meaning they they review everything that you've done, and they do it fa fairly quickly if you did it. There's a higher level of trust, obviously. If it's a pro se case, they have to manually enter all that information. They can issue notice of commencement. They do deficiency not notices. They don't have the power to enter orders. And then the case goes to the case manager, which who does have the power, or they have the power to enter orders at certain levels. And they do the case management, QA docketing, and so forth. And the supervisors manage the business, the whole process. Now, this is... Um, a chart showing you the um, the amount of work that um, Aqua distributed for a six-month period uh, ending uh, last uh, June 30, and I did this just to illustrate the 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 the, the, the level of case uh, management decisions that have to be distributed. If you conceptualize Aqua, what it does is it's, it's the traffic cop. It, every day when you file things or deadlines run or something, that's something that a case manager needs to be involved on for, the, for that leading to go to the next level. The case manager either needs to review it, or they need to calendar, or do they need to get a hearing. So as those things collect during the day, they don't go directly to a case manager, they go into a pot. And because the case managers are working on yesterday's stuff that came in, I mean, it's not instantaneous. The only thing that's instantaneous is the order signing, because then that does go through right away. But those things collect all day. And then at 12.15 a.m. the next morning, 365 days a year, Aqua assigns the various functions that are performed by our case managers. And here they are. This is the total. Claims. You can see in this six-month period, Aqua assigned uh, 24,000 Claims for, uh, for, for QA, in other words, they, claims review, they go through, they look at the PDF, they look what was entered in the system, they make sure it's all accurate, and if it is, then the claim gets officially docketed. And there's in Jacksonville, 24,318, 24,244. You may say, why are there no claims uh, assigned to the Tampa Fort Myers um, case managers? And that's just because we decided that we needed to distribute a heavier workload up to Jacksonville and Orlando because Tampa case managers were busier for other reasons. And it's a good example of how Aqua can be used to distribute workflow. In other words, it is no longer that when you file a claim, it goes to Judge Pasquet's case manager for that case, which was the, the ancient system. Um, what if, you know, unless that case manager were out that day or on vacation, and then you get in all these. Now it all gets distributed without uh, any relationship to the actual case. In fact, they're not even in claims, they're not even distributed any longer to the Tampa, uh, Fort Myers case managers. They go up to the others. Um, the external docket entries, you can see um, there's a total number of those. Those adds up to about 346,000 of those. So those are like when you file a motion. They, get, they come into the pot, you get assigned at 12.15 a.m., then they go to one of the case managers um, in, in, the, in the divisions. Right now, all of our case management um, for your cases in, in Fort Myers are being distributed only to the Tampa case managers. That's for docket entries. Your claims that get filed are, are being distributed to Orlando and Jacksonville. Um, your orders are also being distributed um, locally. And um, of case openings are being distributed um, to five generalists without any regard where you're from. So a case is filed in a Fort Myers, quote in Fort Myers, um, it will be assigned to one of five generalists in either Orlando, there's two there, or one of the three in Tampa. If you file a case in Jacksonville, and it's a Chapter 7, it will be assigned to an Orlando or Tampa generalist. 
uh, they keep for their opening uh, 11s and 13s, and that was a, a matter of just distributing the workload. So you can see, and the point of all this is now we have, we're not, we're not there yet because we still um, are, we still do the Tampa case management in, in Tampa for Fort Myers in Tampa for a lot of things like, your, like the docket entries, but it's still being distributed to all of our case managers without regard to what judge, with, what judge it is. Okay, here's the, um, if a case is filed in CMECF, petition is filed, it goes to the intake, and that's the, the very nice person that deals with the public. They will then enter it in the cash register system. That's what gets a judge and trustee assigned. They, they then send it back up, and Aqua then will assign it to a generalist. Generalist then will go in and see if there are there data entry errors. They can correct those. Are there deficiencies? They do the notices of deficiencies. Um, if there aren't any, they send the 341 notice. Um, and, well, they do anyway, and then they send the notice of deficiency. So you get a notice of deficiency, that's from a generalist. It then goes back in the aqua pool, gets reassigned uh, to distribute to a case manager for the case manager review. Now, this is the work screen in aqua. When this is Debbie Kirkies, she was my, my trainer, and um, I sat down with her. This is when, when she comes to work in the morning, this is what she sees. She has in her, what Aqua is giving her to do that day, there's 16 orders, 117 docket entries, 39 deadlines, and one claim. And um, she's checkmarked docket entries. She wants to work through those first today. And then she wants to do them by case. That opens up this down here, which are, um, and she, Debbie likes to work in just order so what she would do is click on that. Uh, but you can see all the information is there. The docket type, um, this is a docket entry. This uh, CSDQA is court scan docu document. In other words, if Chambers scans a document, they, they will get QA by the case managers. Just because we do it doesn't mean it doesn't go through the uh, QA process. The date filed, what it is, and th this is an actual link to it. And then she'll click on this, and that brings up this screen, which is the specific uh, case. That's one of my cases. Should they go through, they QA it, they can, they can edit the docket. Let's say you put down the wrong docket. Um, you, you call something a motion to determine secured status when it should have been a motion um, for relief from stay or something like that. Um, and also they check negative notice and so forth. Okay, this is, a, this is a motion, the process. When you file your motion, um, these, these go directly to a case manager. That it'll, your motion goes into Aqua Pool, gets assigned at 12.15 a.m., and it goes to one of the Tampa uh, case managers. They then to see if there's any deficiencies, no certificate of service, no reference, uh, you know, to whatever it's, it's relating to, a negative notice might not be right. They can then address the deficiencies. If it's, um, if it's on negative notice, and if the time is run, and there's been no response, then an order will be entered. If it's not negative notice, they have to consider, it, do we need uh, a hearing scheduled? Um, and no, but then an order submitted, yes, goes to CHAP, which it goes to Chambers for assignment, and so forth. And here's the motion to determine secured uh, status that Debbie Kirkies would see and uh, what she would use. Here it says edit docket text, motion to determine secured status. You could go in and edit what the entry was. Um, this is CAR, uh, the wrong case filing. She can go in and correct the wrong case on, on the spot. And this is a, cl a claims review which would pop up. And she'd go down, open up the, the uh, claim in PDF, and then edit the entries that were made to make sure that whatever information was put in there that you would see in the claims register is accurate. And then she can actually correct things at that stage. So every, all of your claims get QA. Um, this is um, a, a screenshot of the internal procedures manual that is open, sitting there open. Uh, 
when the, the case manager is working. This is, for, this is an example. If it was a motion to determine secured status, this is the internal uh, procedures manual that um, Debbie Kirkies would have open, and she could, this is actually going to be four or five pages long. Now, the benefits of Aqua is that we evenly distribute our work among case managers. We, we uh, share uniformly. Our workload is evenly distributed across the, the, the entire district. Um, we can locate documents when we're looking for them. Things can be reassigned. And Aqua knows when people are on vacation, so it doesn't send things to case managers who aren't there because it is tied into another program, and that's our leave program where all of the leave is kept track of. ADI, I mentioned that this is how the computer, um, there are, these are the items we now do use for ADI. Um, this isn't something, you didn't, you'll see the, other, the physical manifestation of it on your end. It's not anything that you get involved in other than you're on the receiving end. And let me give you an example of that. Um, a notice of claim filed by the debtor. You know that um, creditors file claims. But debtors can file claims for creditors, and trustees can file claims for creditors. That happens, not often, but it does. And you know that if a debtor files a claim for a creditor, in every case, the creditor is to get notice of that. We don't need a case manager to be thinking that process through. We know that. So ADI just does that automatically. When they see that the debtor filed a claim for a creditor, ADI sees that, and then we'll go in and notify the creditor and file the appropriate papers in order to process that. Um, in 2015, 23.3% of all, all of our docket entries were produced by ADI, I meaning no human involvement. In December 2015, 20, it was up to 27%. And from December 2010 through December 2015, um, there were 15.6 million keystrokes that were saved, which is it's, it gets back to how do 30, 38 case managers process that many cases for that many people. CHAP is our Chambers Automation Program. This is the old way we used to keep it. It really did. <laughs> you remember that, the books, you know, used to get out and, oh, and Judge Paskey, well, give me a hearing time, you know, whatever you got. And they, it, would take, it would take a while. And this is what they come up now. What uh, Aqua's integrated into CHAP. CHAP is not one, we didn't invent CHAP, but, but we found it. And it was, and we liked it, and so we adapted it into our system, and so it's it's tied together, so that when the case manager is that's QA in your your motion says, oh, this is going to need a hearing date, or we need to send it to Chambers for hearing. But if, but if they send it up, we need a hearing date. It it will this entire line there will be populated with all that information, so the case manager doesn't have to re-notice it except that the case manager will then fill in the date and time of the hearing. And, uh, and then that goes back. Um, this is a noticing directive, which would be immediately uh, prepared. Once the, the um, courtroom deputy fills it in a chat, it goes back into Aqua, and then that interfaces with CMECF. So this entry is not an official notice from the court. Noticing directions. Paul Donovan is directed to prepare, file, and serve the notice of hearing on interest in parties within three days, failure to do so will result in cancellation. Now, now we're in ADI world. So, and then let's say Paul Donovan does it, this, he would do it there. But if he doesn't, he gets a reminder. ADI automatically notices that there's nothing in the docket reflecting a notice of hearing. So it reminds Paul Donovan. And then it says, failure to do so will result in cancellation. No case manager involvement. When Paul Donovan doesn't do it, the hearing is canceled due to notice and service not appearing on the docket. So it's all done by ADI, no, no human involvement. Uh, we're also now making available to Chapter 7 trustees the ability to do um, to self-calendar certain events. And eventually we want to expand that to attorneys and so forth. But this is, at this point, a test project with the Chapter 7. Um, if you want to uh, find out a hearing date or, or what's on my calendar, the best place to go is to the, our website and, and my name or Judge Delano's name and then go to the, it's, it's updated within three to four hours. There's no better source than, than, uh, than chat. Uh, balance, I mentioned those, uh, when you used to be you just sent them in a physical in paper, now you fill out this, this generates a ballot report. 
which then list all the ballots, accept or reject. Electronically, um, electronic exhibits. Um, you all know in, that in bankruptcy court we tried a lot of cases, and, and but every, every one of them, for the most part, is a document case because we deal with contracts. And so it's going to be exhibits, maybe just 10 exhibits. But sometimes, we've all had them, there might be 100, there might be 1,000, there might be 3,000. And as judges, we, we do have those cases. And in every one of them, I would say a third of the time is spent fumbling with exhibits. You know, Your Honor, may I approach the witness to assist in the witness finding exhibit 1,293? You know, and one thing you all may not appreciate is we as judges are struggling just as much as that witness. I'm still back three exhibits ago. I don't want to tell you that because I'd be embarrassed that you don't know that I'm still following. I'll be three, and I'm not following anything because I've got to get that exhibit from this huge binder. And they're always, you know, we go like this and we turn them. And it's just not, it's a, there's got to be a better way. So I had a big case. Where I said, well, listen, I want each of you to have a paralegal sitting next to the witness stand and assist the witness. And I want one for me, too, because I want to be assisted. And they said, Judge, we got a better way. We'll just do it all electronically. And so I had them show up with, with a thumb drive. And we did that for a couple cases. And the idea is the thumb drive gets exchanged. And that's the exchange of exhibits. And um, then in trial, uh, we have our official exhibits. And it's in the thumb drive. And if there's an appeal, we'll find it. I think it, it goes into a box there somewhere. And so we got thinking about there's got to be a better way than have it in a thumb drive sitting in some courtroom deputy's drawer. So we, we, we created a V drive for, for a few cases where the thumb drive would be uploaded to the special drive in our system so that no one, and they, that didn't sound very good either. And that's when um, Mike Brown, this brilliant um, uh, computer guy, uh, created the system where you can now, if you, if you, as long as you save your exhibits in, in number, like plaintiff's exhibit one is, is the, the document number in the folder, plaintiff's exhibit two and on down, and then put those all in one file called plaintiff's exhibits, and then when you open up, uh, there's a exhi evidentiary exhibits for trial is now available to you. Um, and it's, it's available for the main case or adversary. Uh, it says, this filing is on behalf of, and if you're in the case, your name will be there. Brief description of exhibits, plaintiff's exhibits. And then you go in and you choose the file. The, we want you to file separately the exhibit list. And that's going to be the document that the courtroom deputy checks off received or you know, offered, not received. That, because that way we know what's in evidence. And then the exhibits. You, you, you direct the computer to where the file in your computer where all those exhibits are. And then it goes through and it opens up. And that's what it looks like. So exhibit 33, or docket number 33 would be all of your exhibits, one through 10,000 or whatever it is. And uh, we're now installing in all the courtrooms in Tampa, and, and we, this will be district-wide. Um, but I, I know I've got it now in my courtroom where every place has, the, the lawyers on each side have their own screen, the witness has a screen, there's one, there's one for the whole room, and when you go in, um, you can use our computer if, if you want, we'll give you a mouse and a keypad, and then just open up your docket, go to your exhibits, open them, and then you can use that, and they just flash up there. It's very, very, I'm having lawyers do this and they're amazed at how simple it is. Or you can bring your own computer and plug it in. We don't care. And then use your own. What, what I find, the, the software that, software that I, I'm really excited about was the one where you can draw an egg, a, a box around the inconsistent statement and it blows it up. I mean, it's really effective in trial. And you can then, you know, print screen that and save that as an exhibit or what have you. We're also going to make, uh, with the new screens we have, um, you can, uh, they're touch sensitive. And you can do circle something, and you can save that, or you can annotate, you know, or, or have the witness describe, you know, something on there, and then we can save that as a demonstrative exhibit. And then our e-order system, um, if 
This was a submission screen for the prior order program. And now, uh, when orders are submitted, uh, they go into Aqua. Uh, they get looked at by a case manager. They may note some deficiencies. Uh, so they may reject it, send you an email. We've got to do such and such. Otherwise, they come to Chambers. Chambers internally, we each have our own way of handling those. It'll either be signed or rejected, sent back to you. Um, and then it's routed back for docketing. Um, this is a screen showing, let's say you want, you want to know where an order is. You can go in to put your case number, the date submitted, the docket date, just for, and it will show you every order that you have submitted that is in the system. So then you can track it down. And this is an actual screenshot. You can see on the right, status, being processed, being processed, docketed on such a date, rejected, rejected. So it's an actual screenshot. So remember that you can check and follow your orders if you can't find them. It's just, that's just this, uh, the new signature. This is an internal report um, which is prepared as a management tool for the judges. Um, now I have this one here shows me um, where, it, well, every week at 8 p.m. we have a report generated and we don't say Judge 1, Judge 2. In fact, I'll tell you Judge 1 is Judge Williamson. Um, but um, but the, the judges' names actually do appear there. And then um, I get this report and then send it to the judges, but just their own information and the average for the district, just so they can have that as a benchmark. But you can see Judge Williamson had 69 uh, orders somewhere in his system. Some of those were in Aqua, and there's nothing I can do about that. They're just processing through. Supervisor has one, the JA has 34, and that's a lot. But that's, you know, that's because there were a lot of orders. Um, four in the law clerk, and then, but this is the more important number, and I had him add this, is what about over three days? Well, it's only four over three days, and only four for the law clerk, and that's not too bad. That's eight, average is 5.7, and so maybe I need to follow up. But the, anyway, the, this has been useful for the judges internally to be able to follow how they're doing on their orders. And, and we all tend to be competitive. We try to keep those numbers down. Um, E-requests, I mentioned that we have this internal. We've had over 1,321 E-requests. It's an internal thing. It doesn't involve you all, but I tell you, they love it. When I talk to case managers, they really get responses. They have, they have this great idea, and they can send it up, and it gets looked at, and we track those. We have electronic um, training modules available for you. You know, make sure you, your staff knows about. You got a new lawyer doing something for the first time. Let uh, let him or let her go through and and go through those. Also, you see here, we have uh, CLE seminar presentations. You know, uh, now this one would be pretty boring to go watch again. I wouldn't recommend it, but they've got things in there that affect things that you do, and so. Keep those in mind. And this, uh, this is the external procedure manual. It's sitting on my desk. We're about a week away from getting it out, but we're going to have an external procedure manual which will match our internal ones, and then we'll have some programs for you all, maybe some brown bag lunches where we can go through and tell you what's in there and walk you through it. I think it's going to be very uh, useful to you to know, you know, so there's no mystery to what it takes to get things through our system. There's some of the different procedures in the external. Uh, Leanne Bennett is uh, the glue that makes this whole thing uh, function. She got this year an award from the administrative office, the director, the, the number one person on the administration of the court system. She was the p person chosen for his award for the incredible job she's done. And she sits on numerous national co committees. So she's in the know. She works on our budget stuff. Uh, and she always remains available to me. There's not a day that... that goes by that I don't talk to her on the phone, I talk to her coming down here. Um, and Kathy McEwen made us all very proud. She received from the Chief Justice of the Florida Supreme Court the Federal Award for Excellence in the Public Service because of her pro bono work that she's done. She just uh, never quits. The blast you're familiar with, the Bankruptcy Law Educational S Series, it funds pro bono <coughs> clinics throughout the district. It, uh, now has about $70,000 on hand, and it's, it's a very viable organization. There's a, a, a not-for-profit that was just set up. 
I think some of uh, some of your members here may be on the board of directors. Uh, Louis uh, Rivera, of course, uh, is on, on the uh, original board, and that will that will oversee the pro bono work in the Middle District of, of Florida. And with that, I'll conclude my first uh, State of the District presentation. Thank you for having me here. had a few words to follow up. First of all, I really want to thank Judge Williamson for coming down. Uh, Judge Williamson does have a special place in his heart for the Fort Myers Bar. He's always telling me how much he enjoyed coming down here. And I think he's a little jealous that I get to come down here every month. Um, one thing I really need to share with you all is that we all talk so much about what Judge Denneman did in the last four years as she was chief judge working to bring us to being one court with one, in one district. And I really didn't even think about this till we just finished up with the judges meeting um, earlier this week and I mentioned it to Judge um, Williamson as we walked over to the, the room here today. Um, one of the reasons that Judge Gentleman was able to do what she did is because starting before I came on the bench, which is almost eight years ago now, Judge Williamson really made the same effort in Tampa because as Judge Williamson said, there were five judges in Tampa when he joined the bench and everybody did everything every different. And we had some, we had some, I won't call them knockdown drag out discussions, but we had some arm wrestling going on on some issues. And we really managed to put us in a position where the Tampa judges were pretty unified as far as procedures for Tampa and Fort Myers. Jacksonville had always been pretty much unified and that's because Judge Funk came on, a long-term judge had been Judge Proctor and Judge Funk did things the way Judge Proctor did and Orlando had always been unified because Judge Brisman and Judge uh, Gentleman had a pinky promise to do things the same way procedurally and so really Tampa would have been for when I came on the bench four judges each having a different way of doing things and that would have been different from Jacksonville and, and or Orlando and it's really Judge Williamson that made the difference in, in Tampa. One of the things that we talk about, and I know Judge Williamson says it every time he comes down here, we talk about Judge Pasquet being an icon. And I know there are probably some of you in this room that didn't appear before Judge, Judge Pasquet, but Judge Pasquet really was an icon. Um, we have another icon in the room, and that is Judge Williamson. I really appreciate everything that he's done for, for our court and, and for our district. Uh, one thing that probably was going through your minds during Judge Williamson's presentation was that, uh, from your perspective, um, the clerk's office doesn't do as much as it used to because one of the reasons that the clerk's office has been able to do more with less is because we have offloaded some functions back to your staffs and so we're requiring your staff to serve orders which you used to do before CMECF so that's just you know back to the back to the you know less recent past but also requiring you to notice hearings and um, just with the advent of CMECF, it's you know your staff and you yourselves to a large extent create the dockets. It's not just the docket entries that are being made by the clerk's office staff and the case managers, but it's your staff and, and yourselves that are creating the dockets with your docket entries. But I think as you can see from Judge Williamson's um, presentation, it's not as if uh, a lot of work was offloaded to the lawyers and the lawyer staff and the bankruptcy clerks are just sitting back and twiddling their thumbs not doing anything. There's so much work that is being done behind the scenes and I think it really is helpful to have an appreciation of that. Uh, one thing that I wanted to mention to you all and Judge Williamson mentioned about local rules, we have this local rules cycle I know I bore you with every year, but March 15th the new revised amended local rules for this year's local rule season, which will complete a rewrite of every single local rule that we had going back five years ago. Um, those on March 15th, the revisions will be posted for public comment. They'll be on the court's website. It's easy to click on a link and pull up a rule, and I really hope that you'll take the time to do that because we do look uh, to the bar's input on these. It's really uh, helpful to have um, to have input from the local bars and the local um, attorneys and kind of get their input. Um, one thing that Judge Williamson mentioned, he talked about Judge Gentleman saying wanting to develop procedures from the bottom up and rather than the top down. And, and I had to confess to Judge Gentleman about a couple of weeks ago, I never had any idea what she was talking about. 
<laughs> I thought it was just this nice catchphrase. I didn't even know what she meant. Anyway, I finally figured out, oh yeah, the people that are doing the work that are in the trenches, they should be telling us how the things should be done. So we do look to you all um, for your input on those things. Um, one person I want to recognize who's here today is Lori Elwood. Lori is one of our IT staff, and I have to tell you that um, when Lori, when we were watching that little video with the book in the Middle Evil Ages, that's probably what Lori felt like when she goes with my phone with me. Like, Judge, the reason why you don't have any storage is you have all those pictures. <laughs> she shows me how to move those little icons. I still can't make them go. Anyway, <laughs> that, that was just a repeat of our conversation last week with, with my iPhone. Um, another person that's here today is Judge Williamson's um, long-time judicial assistant Mary Maddox and those of you who haven't had a chance to meet her might want to say hello and those of you who haven't yet met Judge Williamson I'm sure he'll be here for a few minutes and please come up and introduce yourselves to him. Um, lastly, um, just a reminder, the ABI annual Pasquet Memorial Seminar is coming up March 31st, April 1st, April 2nd. Um, it is at the Sheraton Sand Key in uh, Clearwater Beach. The hotel itself, our block of rooms, is completely booked. There is a Marriott across the street that maybe is a little bit less expensive because it's not right on the water. Um, but I do hope, if you haven't already registered, that you'll think about registering. We have copies of the brochure um, there on the table. I believe that tomorrow, Friday, is a cutoff date. After that, it's late registration, so you'll save some, I don't know how much it is, I didn't look at the book, probably, you know, $25 or $50, maybe more, I don't know. Anyway, you'll save some money if you register um, by tomorrow rather than waiting till next week. We usually have a great showing from the Fort Myers Bar, and I really hope that you all will think about um, coming up. It's a great seminar. Um, I'm one of the judicial co-chairs for the seminar this year, and there's a... a um, Oh, what do we call it? It's not a steering committee, an advisory board. And the advisory board worked hard to come up with topics that are, that are very, um, uh, very common to your practice. And so we hope it will be a good, a good practical seminar. So I hope to see you. Anyway, I think that wraps up the program. I'm sure Judge Williamson would be happy to take some questions if you feel like asking any yeah, questions. Sure. Throw them under the bus on that one. And I'm always happy to take questions. Jeff. Uh, Judge, I got something <coughs> from... I don't know if it's from the clerk's office or from somebody spamming or whatever, but if I may approach. Yeah. <laughs> uh oh. Oh, I knew I shouldn't have visited that website. It's a I client didn't. in Nigeria. <laughs> no, no. Just send your we tax file. I found yesterday thousand. in a case, and I get this today. I didn't recognize the. Who it was from, yeah. and I didn't want to click on anything because I didn't want a virus or. Okay, um, this, Lori came here specifically for this kind of. <laughs> okay. Okay. So she can help you. There are some private entries now where you'll get a notice of something filed, like under seal or something like that, and that. Uh, in fact, I get these notices, and I think they're spam. But I've been told, no, Judge, that's letting you know something was just filed under seal. So, Lori, you want to take a look at this? This is. Um, I didn't recognize uh, who it was from. You may view the following bankruptcy notice once without charge. Uh, I mean, it appears like maybe the... Yeah. Yeah, it looks like a pacing note, pacing note. Yeah, BNC. BNC, EDI, Noticing, Noticing Center. Center. Yes. Let's just say they're either really, really smart hackers or it's the Noticing Center. Or it's Center. authentic. Yeah, it's, yeah, it looks authentic to me. Okay. Um, you want to forward it? When I get to the spam thing. or the email or the virus where or whatever. Um, it's not funny. We had it happen this week. Oh, we, my God. We literally, they, we got one of those ransom things. Oh, and a we ransom? We have really good software. It supposedly goes okay. through every, every two days. And we didn't pay the ransom because we have backup every night, but... Uh, it took all, almost the entire day oh, that's a to mess. get a larger law firm functioning again. So there's a lot of time that's lost in that. So I do tell oh, you. Oh, no, yeah. I mean, we I mean this may be, you know, we filed a case a seven yesterday, and it may be just something that says that the address was, the, what, the address was incomplete or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. There was some discussion last yeah. year about hey, Judge, moving you? away from CMECF. Yeah. Judge, can you come back here? That way you'll be on the video, since it's being videotaped. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank That's you. That's okay. <laughs>
question is, uh, there was some discussion last year about moving away from CME to ECF. The only thing I know that bears on that is we're going to the next generation of CME CF, and that is in process, and that's a really big deal. You call it next gen. Um, so I, I'm, and I'm pretty sure that's what you may have heard about. Is, is that being implemented now in some test locations? It, it might be. It, it could be it being implemented now in some test locations. It's certainly not being implemented now in in the uh, middle district of Florida. But that will be rolling out, and we'll give you notice of that. If, it involves any changes or any training. So. Okay. Oh, okay. Any other questions about anything? Okay. Thank you all.